in terms of marriage in Islam, as I said, it's essential, it's important. Muhammad said it was half of your religion. Uh, there's actually a tradition I was thinking about uh, yesterday, actually when Susan was speaking about cleanliness is next to godliness, there's also a tradition that says cleanliness is half of your religion. <coughs> so if you get married and you take a shower every day, you're set. Um, <laughs> But of course, you know, I mean, it, the, this is a standard kind, I mean, this is a, a sort of standard trope, in other words, to make the point, to make the, the, the point that, of how important marriage is. So Muhammad says marriage is half of your religion. Uh, he made it very clear there's no monasticism in Islam. Some of his followers wanted to follow a monastic life. They didn't want to be troubled with wives. They wanted to devote themselves completely to spirituality. And Muhammad said, no, it's not acceptable. There's no monasticism in my tradition. No monasticism in Islam. Uh, the Quran also says, talks about marriage, uh, it says that uh, God ordained marriage so that there can be love and mercy between your hearts. And in another passage which is talking about actually Ramadan and, and the ability of men and women uh, who are married to have sexual relations in the evenings during the month of Ramadan, uh, the Quran says, uh, your wives are a garment for you and you are a garment for them this sort of uh, reciprocity. What is a garment? It's something that protects and ennobles. And that's exactly what they're, they're both had that responsibility, that mutual responsibility to the other. Okay. Now, uh, there are uh, many places of mutuality between husband and wife in the Quran. But as I mentioned before, from the Islamic perspective, unlike the Western perspective, the creation of harmonious marriages is not something that is best fulfilled through the assumption of identical rights and responsibilities on the part of both the husband and the wife. Um, men and women are different, right? The male is not like the female. And those differences, particularly biological differences, the biological fact that women bear children, women nurse their children, women are there taking care of their children, means they have a responsibility. And therefore, they should not also have the responsibility of providing financially for the family. Okay. So there's this very clear structure that, that there are certain rights and responsibilities that the husband has toward the wife that the wife does not have toward the husband, and vice versa. And so it is a complementarity. It is an equity based on differing rights and responsibilities, not an equality or an identity of rights and responsibilities. Um, now, this difference, of course, can be problematic. The fact that uh, women, because they have children, should not also be burdened with providing financially for the family. 10 minutes till what? OK. <laughs> um, all right. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be dead. All right. Um, so, uh, so they, uh, because men uh, have this responsibility, this resp sole responsibility for financial support of the family, that's considered a great responsibility, and therefore they have greater rights within the marriage. That is how it is understood as a balance of rights and responsibilities. And men certainly do have greater freedoms and rights within the context of marriage in Islam than women do. But it is understood in this particular way. The financial responsibility is absolute in Islam. Even if a husband is very poor and his wife is very rich, she is not obligated to give him one penny toward the upkeep or the care of herself her household, or her children. That is entirely the man's responsibility, if she does choose uh, to give some of her money to him for those purposes. In some traditions, legal traditions, that's considered officially charity, for which she will be rewarded by God. Um, and so the, the line of responsibility works in that particular way. Um, if a woman is divorced or widowed, Response, financial responsibility for her traditionally reverts to her paternal family. Her brothers, her father, if he is alive, is responsible for her. So marriage doesn't end, doesn't cut that paternal responsibility. 
Um, so from that point of view, uh, men uh, have a financial responsibility not just for their wives and their children, but also for their larger female family members in a way that women do not. Marriage is something, the reason why it's half of your religion, of course, is because being in a relationship of marriage challenges you to be selfless, to think about others, to mature, to become responsible, all things that are, which are very important from the Islamic point of view. Now, in terms of the actual procedures that are involved in marriage, uh, someone just asked me this outside about arranged marriage. Uh, family involvement in marriage is still very essential in Islam, as it is in many traditional cultures. And there still are, yes, in many uh, parts of the Islamic world, and even um, you know, not in Muslim-majority countries, uh, you still do have marriages that can be described as either arranged marriages or semi arranged marriages. The idea in Islam is that when two people get married, it is the marriage between two families. And because who you are depends very much on your family and vice versa. This is something where families are still supposed to be heavily involved. But when parents choose or look for brides or grooms for their, for their sons and daughters, to the extent that they still do in an active way, they are looking for some very specific things, usually. They want to make sure that the marriage is going to be compatible. They want to try to ensure the success of the marriage. And much of Islamic law regarding marriage is oriented toward this, toward ensuring to the greatest possible extent that the marriage will be harmonious and successful. Although it is not an absolute rule, often people will marry within their same socioeconomic status. It is not required to do so in Islam, but it is often done so precisely for the issue of compatibility. Um, a, a person going into, let's say, a different kind of living environment in any way from the one that they were accustomed to is going to be a stressful and a difficult situation. So to the extent that you can marry your son or your daughter to someone who is as similar to them and has as similar an upbringing and an ethnic heritage as you yourself do or your family does, then the understanding is that will lead to a more successful marriage. Um, ethnic and cultural similarity, not something that is ordained in Islamic law, but is something that does develop often in popular tradition for this same reason. Um, the idea that if, you know, one party, you know, even if both parties are Muslim, but they come from dif different ethnic backgrounds, then this can lead possibly to uh, tension. And you will hear stories, it's of course quite difficult in the United States, where you're, you know, it's one thing if you're living in Pakistan and you, know, you are going to marry within your society and it's a relatively homogeneous society, um, but in the United States where you have Muslims that come from all over the world, Muslims that are born here, um, of course, this is sometimes an issue where parents often want their children to marry within that, uh, that ethnic or cultural, um, the same ethnic or cultural heritage as their own. That is not something that is required at all in Islamic law, but it is something that does sometimes develop. Of course, parents are supposed to consider the personality, the compatibility of their child uh, with whoever they are uh, uh, looking to marry them to or looking to arrange a marriage with. Um, but marriages are not all arranged in the Islamic world um, uh, today, especially in the, in the United States or other parts of the Islamic world where often, let's say, men and women might go to college together. Uh, there are other situations that uh, emerge. But still, you, you don't really, in a traditional Islamic society and traditional Islamic families, have dating or courtship um, in the same way that we think about them here in the West. Now, in terms, I'm sorry, yes, go ahead. It depends very much on the family. It depends on what their values or what their considerations are. Um, you know, sometimes you might want to wait, let's say with your daughter, you might want to wait till your daughter has finished her education uh, before you would seek a marriage. A lot of times it is something that is initiated um, by the child himself or herself, indicating a desire to marry or a readiness to marry. Uh, and that, again, it, you know, that's something that's very difficult to speak about in any kind of categorical way, because that has a lot to do with particular cultures, particular families, uh, and their particular 
sets of um, uh, views on marriage. Okay, so it's not something that's, that's clear across the board. But from the point of view of Islamic law, what is clear is that the legal basis of marriage in Islam is a contract or kitab This uh, does not mean that marriage is only a contract <laughs> between men and women, but it does have this legal basis in the contract, as it does also in the Jewish tradition, in the ketubah. Now, um, the, this contract is signed by the groom and by the bride and or the bride's guardian. sometimes referred to as wakil or as wali in Arabic. Although families are supposed to be involved for the marriages of both sons and daughters, in Islam, Islamic law requires that a woman who has never been married before needs to have uh, the uh, consent and the advice of a guardian, a wakil and a wali, in order to get married. If a woman has been widowed or divorced and is remarrying, she can do this without a guardian. The understanding being that a young girl who does not have extensive experience about men um, could be taken advantage of, does not have the ability to estimate the soundness of a particular person as their partner, and so therefore it is necessary to have the advice and the consent um, of a guardian, a wakil or a wali. At the same time, uh, it is very clear that no one, neither male nor female, can be forced into a marriage that they do not want. This invalidates the marriage. Now, you do hear about forced marriages in the Islamic world, but these are violations of Islamic law. A girl who is pushed into marriage where, to which she does not consent, or if her consent is coerced, this is not a legitimate marriage. And that needs to be thought about, because two people living together, if they're not legitimately married in the eyes of God, that is a great and terrible sin. Uh, so it is important that this, uh, this uh, which is sometimes translated, unfortunately, uh, into a great restriction on women or, or the situation where women are forced into marriage by their guardians. That is not the way it should be. It is a clear violation of Islamic law. The purpose of the wakil or wali is really to protect a young woman entering into marriage, to make sure that the marriage is one that is going to look out for her interests. You're talking about two cohesive groups here, right? Because one is the family that she comes from, and one is the family that she's going to, or she's going to create through this marriage. So yes, you certainly do have an obligation to be obedient to your parents. It's not an absolute obligation. Uh, it certainly would be uh, a virtuous thing for a young girl to trust her father, or whoever her guardian may be. If her father's not alive, it might be someone else within the family. Um, to assume that he has her best interests at heart and to be respectful of his choices or the choices that he puts before her, perhaps. But at the same time, if she really feels that this marriage is not going to work, that she is not going to be able to live in a harmonious match with this person, this is not the marriage match that she wants, she has the right in that particular case to say that she does not give her consent. And without that consent, the marriage is not valid. Yes. Yes. 
Yes, I will. Mm -hmm. Yes? It functions that way, in a way, yes. But it is more than that. Um, when, when, the, um, when, the, when the groom and the bride uh, sign this contract, they are agreeing, essentially, to abide by the Islamic laws regarding marriage. And that's implicit in the signing of this contract. But what's made explicit in the contract, or what can be, are a set of conditions that the woman might set upon her future husband. The most common, most uh, and actually required uh, of those conditions is what is known as the meher, sometimes translated as dowry, sometimes um, offensively, from my point of view, translated as bride price. Um, but it, essentially, it is um, the money or property or some other goods that the groom promises to give to his bride. And this is a required element of marriage. There must be some gift that the groom gives to the bride. Otherwise, the marriage is not, again, valid. This is a requirement of the marriage. Um, it could be a 10,000 square foot estate. It could be a copy of the Quran. And so the terms that are set are not, are not, you know, there's no limit one way or the next, but there must be some gift that is given, whatever that might be. Uh, the meher is commonly a, an exchange of money or some kind of property. In many cases, that dowry or that meher will be deferred, or part of it will be deferred. So for example, uh, if a certain amount of money is set as the dowry, half of it might be given up front. The other half is held in reserve. Uh, in the case that the husband divorces his wife, or if he dies, that money has to be immediately payable to her, the rest of that, that dowry. <clears throat> now, the dowry, or the, let's say, the, the dowry itself, or let's say the, uh, the conditions that are listed, might also include non-material things. For example, uh, a woman might include in her contract that her husband will allow her to pursue her education. It might include that he will pay for the education. It might include the ability to work. It might include how often he needs to take her to visit her family or pay for her to visit her family. All kinds of conditions can be put into this marriage explicitly by the bride. The groom does not make any additional conditions on this. This is a, uh, a, a protection and an opportunity that is presented for women entering into marriage. Some legal schools will say that a woman can even write into her contract, it's not universally agreed upon, can write into her contract conditions that would give her additional rights or protections uh, even against Islamically uh, allowable things. So for example, um, it is possible in some schools of law for a woman to clearly write in her contract that she will never accept uh, an addition, the man, her husband to take an additional wife. Or that uh, granting her a sort of um, uh, right to divorce at will. Some schools of law don't accept this and say that's not acceptable because that's changing the actual structure and laws of marriage that were established. But others do allow them uh, to write these kinds of things into their contract. So if properly worded, the contract can be a very significant protection for a woman's interests entering into marriage. Not just her interest in the immediate term, but her interest in the long term. Yes. Well, I mean, let's say, I was going to talk more about polygamy in a minute, but within the context of that, let's say taking an additional wife, um, in any case, if a man is married to one woman, he wants to take a second wife, it, he has to get the consent of the first wife. 
Um, but of course, you know, that can get into all kinds of issues. I mean, how do you, you know, you can manufacture consent sometimes. Um, but stating it in very clearly in the contract would be one way of saying there's no question about it. Yeah. Well, when the, I mean, there are rights that are within the context of Islamic law that govern marriage in general, and that's just always there. These are additional things in the matter. I mean, everyone knows that you would put the matter in there. Um, but uh, the, the other additional things, yes, I mean, it's quite possible that a woman herself or even her guardian may not know that, that they can write these things into the contract, may not want to, um, you know. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you could write all the conditions in the world that you want, but someone may not agree to them. <laughs> um, so, that, you know, it, it, I mean, it's a negotiation in that sense. Um, but yes, it does have to be, um, I mean, whatever is in the contract then is legally enforceable. And someone mentioned that it's a prenuptial agreement. It becomes, uh, it has uh, gotten to be somewhat of an issue in the United States uh, with how do you deal with these marriage contracts? Because if you have people who are married in the United States, they get divorced, you know, there are U.S. divorce laws that split things 50-50. Um, and yet, essentially, what the contract is saying is that, you know, upon divorce, a woman gets this amount of money, sometimes like a, kind of like a lump sum alimony payment. I mean, it can sort of function like that in certain cases. Um, and so the question is, you know, the, the courts have tried to decide, you know, what, what do we do here? On the one hand, it's a contract. It's signed by two persons. It should be legally enforceable. Um, it functions like a prenuptial agreement. We honor prenuptial agreements. On the other hand, it's also a religious document, but this is a U.S. court of law, separation of church and state. Can you really enforce a religious document? And uh, to my knowledge at this point, it's still something that goes back and forth. In other words, it's decided case by case by individual courts. Um, but yes, it, does, it can function like a prenuptial agreement. Fly here. Um, and it can go either way. I mean, in some cases, the <laughs> When a divorce happens, the, uh, the, the, the mahar that a woman is supposed to receive might be more than what she would receive if she you know, was half of her husband's estate. Um, often, of course, it's, it's the other way around. Yes, I'm sorry, you had a question. Yeah, I was just wondering, is this um, contract um, for men of all sorts of economic backgrounds? What if the husband, let's say, is a poor background, doesn't own property, doesn't have a lot of savings, or doesn't have a lot to offer the wife? What happens when she delivers? Well, he still has to offer her something. No, in, in, in other words, the, you know, what you would give, you know, as a mahar, whether it's, you know, um, a bouquet of flowers or, uh, you know, a set of gold jewelry or whether it's a you know, piece of property is going to depend very much on your socioeconomic status. And again, I mean, it's, it's something that has to be negotiated. I mean, think about that. It's not that this is sort of a free bill and you, you know, uh, the man has to agree to all of the terms. Um, and so, obviously, you know, some people are in a better position to negotiate than others for various reasons. 